Hi, hello. Welcome to the episode of Isaiah's Newsstand. It's your host, Isaiah Edwards. The date. The date is October the 18th, 2024. Hope this episode finds you well in good spirits and high hopes. As for me, I'm doing pretty good. Uh, let's see here. Uh, for starters, I called out today. I just took a day for myself. Uh, so it's been nice. It's been good. Um, I um, I guess we can kind of just do a little bit of food corner here, a little food corner there. Um, I went to Einstein um, Bagel Bros or whatever um, and uh, had a pretty good meal. Had the uh, Novolox again, had the pretzel bagel with honey almond cream cheese, and I had the French toast bagel with strawberry cream cheese. Uh, I tried their Thai tea, and I feel like I can officially say the one thing I don't like about this place is their beverages. I don't think their beverages are that good. Uh, the coffee each time I've gone has kind of been a little eh. And then, um, let's see, the I tried the Thai tea because I was like, oh, that's interesting. And like, it just had like this gingery taste that I normally am not used to when I drink Thai tea. That made me feel like I was like drinking like something out of a Starbucks or like a Wendy's. It just, it didn't feel that good. It didn't taste that good. So, um, but it was okay. It was, it was not bad. I shouldn't say it didn't taste that good. It just didn't taste that great, I guess I should really say. But um, the bagels were good. So, you know, that was enjoyable. That was, that was fun. Uh, let's see here. Um, but then after that, I went to the gym and that was good. Um, I did a little bit longer run on the Stairmaster than I usually do. So that was, that was a bit tiring. And I also, I think I hit my personal best on my leg press. So that felt really good. Uh, so yeah, you know, here we are now. Let me talk about Food Corner from last night because that was pretty good. I had a burger, hot dogs, and fries. I uh, tweaked the burger a little bit. I put some Thousand Island dressing on it, along with like all the other stuff I usually put on. Definitely came together. It was really nice. It was really yummy. Uh, let's see here. Is there really anything else I wanted to report in about? No, I think we're good. I think we're golden. Uh, let's go ahead and do our startup, and we'll get into some news. can't tell if I'm like getting a cold or if I'm just nasally because like the weather's changing. I don't know. I'm not sure yet. Jury's still out on that. Alrighty. Uh, First story is coming from The Guardian. North Korean troops have arrived in Russia to fight Ukraine, says uh, Seoul. South Korea's intelligence agency said on Friday that North Korea had dispatched troops to assist Russia in its war against Ukraine, a development that could intensify the standoff between North Korea and the West. In a statement on its website, The National Intelligence Service, or NIS, said Russian Navy ships transferred 1,500 North Korean Special Operation Forces to the port of Vladivostok between uh, October the 8th and 13th, uh, who are now undergoing training. The North Korean soldiers are expected to be deployed to the front lines as soon as they complete their adaption training. Uh, the agency said, adding that uh, more North Korean troops were expected to be sent to Russia soon. NIS and uh, said uh, North Korean soldiers were given Russian military uniforms and Russian-made weapons and were issued with fake ID cards of residents of uh, I'm gonna just butcher it. I'll just go for it. Uh, Yakuita and Buryata. Uh, two regions of Siberia. So I feel like that's just like they got these guys coming out of nowhere, essentially, with just like these AI IDs and they're in Russian uniforms with Russian weapons, um, which I was really confused about because like I'm thinking, what is the big fuss 
because we already know that North Korea and Russia are working together. They're they're kind of, you know, kindred spirits, birds of a feather, if you will. They had that arms conversation earlier when, you know, fucking um, Kim Jong-un took that big train ride and they were all hanging out, palling around. And so I'm like, what's what's the angle here? But then you realize oh, the Kremlin is denying this. They're saying this is fake news. It's not real. We're not working with North Korea in that capacity. Much like the, the you know, ammunition things. Like, no, we're not actually accepting, you know, ammunition from them. Pish posh. Um, so, you know, but we have NIS. We have, you know, South Korea also saying that, oh, not just these 1,500. There's going to be 12, I think, 12,000? Yeah, 12,000 troops. Um, yeah, additionally, so- South Korean media said on Friday, citing anonymous sources, that Pyongyang had decided to dispatch a total of 12,000 troops formed into four brigades uh, to Russia. The NIS did not immediately confirm these reports. So I'm not going to say that's dubious. I'm just saying that that's what one side of this conversation is saying, not all sides so far. Uh, Zelensky has kind of come out. Which definitely makes sense because he's trying to definitely spotlight any kind of issue he can to kind of get more aid, you know, more uh, just support, whatever, you know. So um, he's come out and said, oh, well, we for sure know our intelligence says we have 10,000 North Korean soldiers who are preparing to enter the war. Which he's saying is like the first step to a world war. Which I'm kind of like, that's, to me, is stretching it. Because you already have an ally in the West. Like, multiple allies in the West. Like, you're not NATO, but you practically are. So, like, I, I don't really feel like that that's really the case. Well, oh, it's boosting the ground. I'm like, you technically have, like, foreign legion and shit like that. Random ass motherfuckers and shit getting involved. So, I don't know. Like... Is this number that much to really move the needle on this? I don't know. Who can say? Uh, I know that also North Korean engineers have also been sent out into the field to kind of help, like, handle ammunitions and things of that nature, ammunitions, missiles, yada, yada, yada. So, I mean, that's a thing. It's definitely a new layer on this um, conflict and what's going on, that's for sure. Um, I didn't expect it, but at the same time, like, I, I kind of let this drag a bit because I was like, okay, so there's North Korean troops on the border or they're, they're about to be in the Kursk region or something like that. Okay, interesting. Let's see how this plays out. Um, so yeah, I mean, here I am now yapping about it, but yeah, I'll keep you posted on any more news. Man, yeah, I definitely feel like I have the sniffles. I don't know if this is confirming it or not. Um, let's see here. From Reuters. Los Angeles Archdiocese, sorry, I got something in the way here, uh, reaches $880 million sex abuse settlement. The Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Los Angeles has agreed to pay $880 million to 1,353 people who allege that they were sexually abused as children by Catholic priests in the largest settlement by a U.S. diocese over decades old abuse claims. Archbishop uh, Jose H. Gomez expressed sorrow for the abuse in announcing the settlement on Wednesday. I am sorry for every one of these uh, incidents from the bottom of my heart, Gomez said in a statement. My hope is that this settlement will provide some measures of healing for what these men and women have suffered. Uh, The Archdiocese began um, mediating the abuse claims after California enacted a a law that allowed new lawsuits to be based on past instances of sexual abuse involving involving minors. So which leads me to believe that it's like, oh, yeah, you're really heartfelt, you have heartfelt sorrow, you feel really bad, after the fact now that you have to deal with these claims like it's not like you were proactively doing this shit so i feel like that's definitely important to mention in this situation uh but we move uh the california law and similar laws in other states have driven many large catholic organizations to seek bankruptcy protection around the uh, around the u.s in california the archdiocese of san francisco and the Diocese of Oakland and San Diego have filed for bankruptcy to resolve similar abuse claims. Uh, let's see. The Los Angeles Archdiocese reached its settlement without filing for bankruptcy. 
Gomez said the archdiocese would be able to pay the victims uh, from cash reserves, investments, loans, and contributions from other religious organizations that have been named in the lawsuits. Uh, the payments will not impact the archdiocese's mission of serving the poor and vulnerable in our communities, Gomez said. So I'm sure maybe for both sides, this really is a win-win for the overall, like, I don't know, Catholic congregation or what have you. This is good. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's unfortunate that this fucking happened, but at least you're getting some kind of recompense. And like I said, for the, I guess, the overall greater whole, you get to say, hey, you guys can still keep doing your mission, still keep doing your thing. You still got the kid, you know, doing the little smoke ball thing. I don't know, whatever. Um, I really have not been that religious, you know, these days, <laughs> at least these days. Uh, so I, I always kind of come to these situations like, yeah, I mean, I would want to take them for everything. But I also understand, too, that it's like it could be a big, whole, long, drawn-out affair. This is a whole-ass organization. So it's like, hey, if this is good for the goose and the gander, it's good for me, and we can just kind of wrap this up. We are at least acknowledging that I did go through a thing, and it was fucked up, and I survived that, but at least I have some kind of recompense and that acknowledgement. Okay, good to go. I get that for the people involved in the situation. And that's a lot of people, you know? Fucking, once again, over 1,300 people involved in this situation, specifically. And we've covered these kind of situations before. I've definitely missed some in the past. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's definitely a shame whenever we cover it. But, um, you know, glad that some people are at least getting something out of, uh, you know, this really dark, fucked up moment that they had to go through. Uh, but yeah, let's, uh, I guess we'll pray on that and we'll move on. Um, from the Los Angeles Times... Former Canadian Olympic snowboarders charged with uh, running drug trafficking or uh, drug trafficking organization ordering killings. This this is rough. This this felt like like a I feel like you could make like a Netflix style like Cool Runnings or something meets Blow. I don't know. You got Sean White meets Blow. I don't know. Some kind of energy like this. And it could have been a fun thing until we get to the four fucking murders, uh, you know, then then, it, then it's not so savory, not so wholesome. But I mean, I guess it is still giving blow there. I feel like you maybe could do it. Maybe it's like a pain and gain kind of thing. But um, yeah, Netflix, Hulu, hit me up. I can I can I, we can make this work. We could write this out. Um, but yeah, let's 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 dive into this. It was a career pivot to say the least. Also, shout out to was it Noah Goldberg? I, I love I love a good solid pun just to start things off. That's classic. Uh, Ryan James Wedding, forty three, was once an aspiring snowboarder who competed in the twenty uh, in the two thousand two I'm sorry Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City. He came in twenty fourth for Canada in the men's parallel giant slalom. So, I mean, I don't know. It doesn't seem like he meddled if that is the highest accomplishment you're telling me here. Uh, but federal prosecutors alleged uh, Thursday that Ryan Wedding had chosen a different path following his snowboarding career. He had become a major trafficker of cocaine into Canada and the United States, a ruthless leader of a criminal drug, uh, drug enterprise who would stop at nothing to keep his business. Uh, the, the Wedding criminal enterprise running smoothly. I wonder who who is who is that rev who's referencing who's saying that quote um because uh, apparently this guy was going by El Jefe and Public Enemy uh as some monikers once again I'm like who is calling him that I saw a picture of this guy and I'm like I don't know man this seems like he's like a folk singer for like a cover band or something or like you'd see him at Bonnaroo or something high on acid or mushrooms I I don't look at this guy and go yeah that's El Jefe that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, like, well, I don't, I don't, I don't know who, who you think this guy is. He just doesn't look like that to me. But I mean, hey, he definitely, I guess, had the, the, the secondary career to back it up. Um, let me see here. Let's scroll ahead. Oh, also, this is very important. They are charging him or whatever, but they don't have him. He is on the loose. So, I mean, we, hopefully we can get to the story again with an update that he has uh, gotten captured, I guess. But yeah, he's still at large. Um, at least, uh, saying, uh, FBI agent, special agent, uh, charge Christy Hawkins. Dude, that is a hardcore ass fucking name for law enforcement. I'm sorry. Like once again, this, this shit is writing itself. <laughs> uh, prosecutors announced a sprawling superseding indictment Thursday, charging wedding 
with conspiracy to export cocaine, with running a continuing criminal enterprise, and with three murders in connection with the operation as well as an attempted murder. Uh, the superseding document amends and replaces the original indictment. I thought it was four people were murdered, but maybe I'm, I'm getting that wrong. Uh, let's see. But the organization ran from 2011 to 2024. Um, the second in command uh, was Andrew Clark. He was arrested uh, this month in Mexico. So they do have at least some people, um, or at least, uh, and I know that like the overall organization is being charged, or at least like the group, uh, they move 60 tons of cocaine per year, Estrada said, calling the enterprise extremely prolific. It was a billion-dollar organization, federal prosecutors said. Uh, prosecutors said as part of their investigation, they seized more than a ton of cocaine, dozens of rounds of ammunition, and more than $3 million in cryptocurrency. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, also just, just a note about cryptocurrency. I love that like both, and, and also just to talk about the election real quick. I love that both sides have kind of like rushed to pander to crypto bros who have like, we've talked about the crypto winner, all the fucking shit that they've kind of gone through the FTX bullshit. And it's like, once again, it's crazy that crypto is still a thing that is still rising. We've also talked about it, you know, booming in the fucking financial market and all that kind of fucking shit. So, I mean, it's definitely kind of come down from those highs, kind of leveled out a bit. But, I mean, it is a thing now that it's crazy that, like, once again, that is something that is on the political docket to talk about for Donald Trump and Kamala Harris. And they're both like, oh, yeah, yeah, you can totally do your thing, for sure, for sure. Anyway, but really, once again, this is what cryptocurrency is really good for at the end of the day. No one's trying to buy a burger so they can be like Donald Trump and shit. You want to fucking move that goddamn weight. And how do you want to get paid? In goddamn cryptocurrency on the goddamn fucking dark web, okay? That's how this shit really works. That's how this shit really moves. And at the end of the day, it's never going to be something that's probably that traded or used. But, like, whatever. I get that why it exists, um, you know, it, it does have use. It's not fake money. It's not, not real. I know I'm in the weeds here, but I don't know. I felt like that was something I kind of just wanted to talk about again. Uh, but yes, back to the story at hand. Um, let's see. Together, Wedding and Clark ruled the Enterprise with an iron fist, Estrada said. They were killers. Anyone who got in their way, they would target with violence, including murder. Uh, let's see, the duo would hire contract killers and take out hits on people who they believe got in, in the way of their business. In November of 2023, they ordered the killings of an Indian couple visiting Canada who they believed had stolen a cocaine shipment. It was a case of mistaken identity. The couple was shot to death in front of their daughter who was shot but also survived. And then there's another murder. So I, I guess they only attached, uh, no. Let's see, there's the one, two, and then I guess there's a third one here. Um, hold on. In April of 2024, Clark and another co-defendant, Malik Damien, ordered the killing of another man in on Ontario who was shot to death in his driveway. One month later, Wedding and Clark allegedly had another man killed over a drug debt as he sat in his car in the driveway of his home. So I understand now. As a whole, there's like four killings on the jacket. But for specifically, we're talking wedding, he only has the three because Clark and Damien, I guess, so that was their own thing. It's weird, though, because I would think with, like, a Rico charge or something like that, you could just charge them all together. I don't fucking know. Maybe, maybe not on that. I don't know. Whatever. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, let's see. This is not the first time uh, wedding ran afoul of the law. In 2008, he was arrested on cocaine trafficking charges. Uh, he was convicted of conspiracy to possess and distribute cocaine in federal court in San Diego of 2009 after a jury trial. As part of a joint investigation, 12 people were arrested in the U.S., Canada, Colombia, and Mexico in connection with uh, the drug trafficking enterprise. Authorities are offering a $50,000 reward to anyone who has information leading to the arrest of wedding. So, awesome. I mean, not awesome. <laughs> Not awesome. That's not how I wanted to close that out. But you know what I mean. Very interesting. Um, like I said, to me, in my head, this plays out like a fucking movie. Um, but yeah, I, I, hopefully we have an update and, um, you know, this guy's apprehended, you know. Um, but yeah, let's uh, let's close out. We have uh, one more thing I wanted to cover. 
Um, bit of a sad random story, but a, a bit of a silver lining in its, its own way. Um, but yeah, let me take my last break and we will go ahead and get to that. Oh man, oh man, oh man. All right, from People Magazine. Ooh, let me find my cursor. Okay, here we go. Uh, Jake E. Lee, former Ozzy Osbourne guitarist, shot multiple times in Las Vegas in random attack. Jake E. Lee, a guitarist for Ozzy Osbourne, Badlands, and Red Dragon Cartel, was shot multiple times in a street shooting in Las Vegas on Tuesday, October 15th. His representatives and Las Vegas Police Department confirmed to people. The 67-year-old musician is currently at a Las Vegas hospital in, in, in the intensive care unit where he is fully conscious and doing well. Um, Lee's rep confirmed in a statement, adding that Lee is expecting to fully recover. So that's the good news here. That's a silver lining. Um, authorities believe that the shooting was completely random. Lee was shot early in the morning around 2.45 local time. The Las Vegas Police Department tells People. Lee's representative said uh, that he was out at that hour to take his dog on a walk. Lee and his family appreciate uh, respecting their privacy at this time. The Rockers rep concluded in his statement. Um, so yeah, that's really unfortunate that that happened to him, but glad that he's okay and in one piece. Uh, definitely if I hear any updates, uh, you know, I'll definitely be here to let you know about that. Um, but yeah, such a weird, random, odd thing. Like, you would definitely think there's just a, some kind of motivation or reasoning behind something like that. But, you know, it's, it's, like I said, as we know, as recording, it's random. Um, so yeah, that, that's it. That's all I have for today. Uh, let's see. If you'd like to help out, support the effort, I do have a Patreon. Patreon.com. So Isaiah like News. Become a newsie today. I do shout you out at the top of the month, uh, plug a project if you'd like. Um, also, you get access to any kind of old archive episodes that I've had that were like either like practice or I felt like I wasn't ready to really talk about them on the main or what have you. Those, those are there. Um, but free ways to hit me up at news one at gmail.com. Feel free to follow me or the podcast on any of the socials that you're on. And uh, please subscribe to the YouTube. That really helps out a lot and uh, also keeps you abreast of what's going on. Um, leave a cool comment. That's always really helpful. Leave a like. Sharing is caring. It can be fun. I appreciate y'all. I saw a newsy share. Uh, I do a, sh a retweet, actually. So, you know, shout out. Shout out, shout out. Thank you. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it, it means a lot. It's really helpful. But really, the best thing is just listening. It's just kicking it with me, you know, hearing me nasally explain the news like I am today. That really does mean a lot. It really warms me up. Uh, but yeah, that's it. That's all I really have for today. So um, thanks so much for tuning in. Thanks so much for being a friend. And hopefully I see you soon for some more good news. I love you. Bye-bye.